Hello everyone. Yes, we'll be starting around five to ten minutes. So just hold on. Welcome everyone, yes, we'll be starting in 5 to 10 minutes. Reminder that uh, Holy Week is this week. We have Holy Week services on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Our Good Friday service will be at 8.30. Our Easter Sunday will be as normal 9.30. Hope that you can join us. Everyone, welcome. Uh, just hold on for just a moment. We'll be starting quite soon. So just want to promote uh, Reverend Dr. Lim Kayong's book on following Jesus. Uh, you can scan the QR code if you're interested to purchase it. Uh, this is a promotion until uh, the 15th of April, so uh, it's around 80 ringgit for a copy, including shipping fee. <clears throat> okay, hello everyone. Yes, we'll be starting about two, two, two minutes like that. Uh, this session will be recorded and uh, available on our YouTube page in a day or two. So don't worry if you missed anything. We will also be giving you the slides uh, later. Uh, later, I'll be posting a link uh, which will bring you to a feedback form. That's how we will collect the email so that we can send you the slides. Yeah, so I'll be sending you a short, uh, short form later uh, during the intermission. Welcome everybody. We are sitting in a minute. So just hold on.
Okay, good morning, everybody. We'll be starting uh, right now. Uh, yes, so we are in our second session of our CD series, uh, Kingdom and Parables by Reverend Dr. Lim Ka Yong. Uh, so yes, uh, this session will be recorded and available on our YouTube page. Uh, also, secondly, uh, we'll be sending you the slides later. So how we will send you the slides is that we will collect your emails uh, via a Google form. Uh, this Google form is a feedback form. So every CD class, we would usually send up uh, a feedback, a short feedback form for uh, you guys to fill in so that you can help us improve. Uh, so we would appreciate your help on that. Uh, so before I pass the time to uh, Reverend Dr. Lim Kayong, I just want to uh, yeah, just highlight a few things. Uh, first, I uh, just will appreciate if you kept your microphones on mute. Uh, uh, for question and answer, uh, what we'll be doing is that we'll be putting up a Slido link in just a moment. Uh, and this is where uh, you can uh, enter your questions. Uh, you Alternatively, you can uh, alternatively, you can message me privately uh, on either on WhatsApp or on Zoom uh, your questions so that I can uh, put it in for you. Uh, another thing of note is uh, for Reverend Dr. Lim Kai Lim Ka Yong's book on following Jesus. Later, we would have the slide with uh, the QR code. Uh, it's 80 ringgit uh, just for this season. So uh, if you're interested, uh, please do give that a look. Uh, so yeah, that's all about it for housekeeping. So uh, before we start, I will just uh, open open with a word of prayer. Father, as we come before your feet to learn about your word uh, through your gospel from your servant Matthew, uh, we want to ask Lord Father that Lord you would uh, reveal to us uh, your insights and the thing that you want us to learn. So we want to pray for the speaker, Reverend Dr. Lin Kayong, that as he speaks or that you would speak through him, that your Holy Spirit will be present in our meeting. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'll pass the time to Reverend Dr. Lin Kayong. Hi, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, glad to see all of you in our second session as we reflect on the parables of Jesus, focusing on the Gospel of Matthew. Also, a very uh, blessed uh, Palm Sunday to all of you. Uh, I just got back from the church service, and because today is Palm Sunday, our liturgy is a little bit longer, so it takes on a little bit more time. So when I got back, I didn't have time to change, so you can still see me in my clergy uh, uh, shirt. Uh, for this morning, what we all aim to do is to look at a series of parables, one just before Jesus entered into Jerusalem. So I thought it would be good to look at that particular parable, the parable of the vineyard worker. And this is one, this is in fact according to the Gospel of Matthew, the last parable that Jesus spoke before he entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And since today is Palm Sunday, I thought it would also be good for us to reflect on that. And then after that, you'll be looking at the series of parables found in Matthew chapter 24 and, and 25. Uh, this is a part of the conversation that Jesus had with his disciple on Mount of Olives. And we often call this conversation, uh, this extended conversation that is recorded for us in Matthew 24, uh, 25 as the Olivet Discourse. And this Olivet Discourse is placed within uh, the Holy Week, which begins today right up to uh, Holy Saturday, right up to Easter. So this is the season of the uh, Holy Week or the Passion Week. And the Olivet Discourse is delivered by Jesus according to the Gospel of Matthew during this week. So it's appropriate that we thought that we will also reflect on the teaching of Jesus during his final week uh, of his life uh, on earth. Okay, let's jump straight into Matthew chapter 20. If you have your uh, Bibles, you might want to turn uh, together uh, with me as we look at Matthew uh, ch chapter uh, uh, 20. Matthew chapter 20. I will read to you from verse 1 right up to verse 16. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to verse 16. The parable of the workers in the vineyard or the parables of the vineyard workers. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them in denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. And so they went. 
He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, he answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, begin with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they begin to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the heat of the day. But he answered to one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the last, the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. But this is quite a very interesting parable that Jesus told. And he begins with the, uh, this phrase, the kingdom of heaven is light. So this is part of a parable of the kingdom. And what we have gone through the last session, we are looking at how Jesus taught us how to live life in the kingdom of heaven or in, in the kingdom of God that he has come to inaugurate. And so here, we are looking at what Jesus taught us about what life in the kingdom. As I said earlier on, this is the last parable in the Gospel of Matthew uh, before Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Now, it's quite interesting when you look at this parable. Uh, this particular landowner went out early in the morning, found a group of people there. He hired them and sent them to work. Now, notice that when he hires them, he agreed to pay them a denarius. So a denarius is uh, a, a day's wage in the times of Jesus. So just like when someone hire you, you agree to the salary and you go and do your work. And interestingly, after that, uh, at nine o'clock, he went out to the, to the marketplace. He saw people standing there, which means this group of people that were standing at nine o'clock, they would have missed the first batch of uh, employers who were looking for days, laborers, have hired them. I actually realized this when I was in Pakistan years ago. Uh, I was dry, uh, 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 I stayed in a house and I teach in a seminary from the place where I stayed to the seminary that I was teaching is probably about 20 minutes drive. So what the seminary did was they get a taxi driver to pick me up from my accommodation and uh, drove me uh, to the seminary. And every morning we will pass through a large marketplace, a large square, and then and that mom, and, and every morning when I when, when the taxi driver drove me about seven or seven, seven thirty in the morning, you will see a lot of people lining up in the market square. And they came with their tools, you know, the jungle and all those things, you know. Uh, they, were, they were all standing there. Then I asked the taxi driver, what are these people doing? He said, Oh, this is the marketplace where the contractors will come to look for workers. So whether the um, the, the, the employment agency or the owners, they'll come and they'll look for workers. And what they'll do is when they come in the morning, they'll look at, I, I need 10 workers uh, today to, in my construction site. So they'll just pick 10 able-bodied person. They'll look at them and then they put them into the van and off they go. They got the job guaranteed for the day. If you're not being picked up that morning, uh, chances are that you will not be picked up later on in the day. So you just imagine as the clock ticks, you know, it starts at six o'clock, as the clock ticks, seven, seven, six o'clock, one potential employer came, pick you up and off you go. Then someone came, picks up someone and off you go. So you imagine you're the one standing there, six o'clock, seven o'clock, you're not being picked up. Eight o'clock, you're not being picked up yet. Nine o'clock, you're not being picked up, which means that the chances of you being hired for the day is getting slimmer and slimmer. So this vineyard worker is a very generous employer. He went out at nine o'clock. He saw people that were not being employed. Hey, come, go and work in, in my vineyard. He went out noon. 
goodness, he still see people lying around in the market square. So you imagine if you're one of those workers, you'll be worrying whether you got food on the table for that day. He saw them and he also sent them to work. And then he actually, then at five o'clock, he went out. He also saw another group of people there. He asked, hey, what are you still doing here? In verse seven, this worker answered, because no one has hired us. So you also go work in my vineyard. And then at six o'clock, uh, it's pay time. And then interestingly, uh, when you pay, uh, you pay you, you, this, this, this vineyard owner doesn't pay from the one who hired at six o'clock. He paid at the one hired at five o'clock. So he gave one day salary to the one who hired, who hired at five. Maybe you work one hour, you get one day salary. So you just imagine if you're at the three o'clock, you're at the nine o'clock, you're at the six o'clock that you hired, what would, what would be your expectation? Now, so this is where I want to ask you to think. And if you like to type your answers, uh, you can actually do so in your chat box. Uh, if this is allowed, Yong, is this allowed for them to share in the chat box? Yeah, yeah, they can type. Ah, so what you just type. So I'm just asking you a question. How would you have felt when the landowner pays the wages? Let's say he starts with a five o'clock first. You only work one hour, you get a day salary. How would you have felt? And then if you're three o'clock, when you see the five o'clock paid one denarius, what would you expect? Did you expect more? And what about noon? What about nine o'clock? What about the one hired at six o'clock? How would you have felt? And when you receive your salary, the wages for day, everyone is being paid equal. How would you have felt? Now, I just want you to imagine if you're six o'clock, how would you feel? You're nine o'clock, how would you feel? If you have any responses, maybe just take a minute or two to just type in into the chat box any responses that you might have if you want to respond. Ah, Lai Xiong said this is unfair. <laughs> okay, anyone else would like to... Uh, uh, response. Yeah, just feel free to type in your answers. Uh, we'll say this is injustice, is puzzling. Uh, uh, I'm overpaid if you're five o'clock. Okay, there's no logic to it, right? It's unfair. At one time, someone suggested to me, maybe this should be a parable of uh, a poor HR manager who reviews the salary of everyone. <laughs> you know? So you think about it, you know? It's unfair. Yes, precisely, it's unfair because how can you pay someone at five o'clock the same salary as someone who hired at six o'clock? And because of this, it naturally leads to a lot of murmuring and grumbling, right? So it's unfair. Yes, for all of us, uh, who we always, I would say it is unfair too, right? But imagine you're a five o'clock workers. You go and work for one hour. You hardly sweat, for example, and you get a full day salary. How would you have felt? What a great surprise. I don't deserve it, but I got it. Okay, now let me move on. Thank you for your responses. Let me move on. We have talked about the perspective of the workers. What about the landowner? Now you're the landowner. You decide how much salary to give. You can afford to be generous. You can afford not to be generous. How would you have felt when you hear all the workers complain and murmur to you? When you hear all the complaints and the murmuring of the workers, how would you have felt? As a landowner, you, 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 you go back and read the parable in verse 2. You agreed to pay the 6 o'clock one denarius and you pay them one denarius. You're not being unfair, right? Hey, this is a salary we agreed, so I paid you what we have agreed. It's just that I decided to be generous to the 5 o'clock, to the 3 o'clock, uh, uh, to the noon one. Uh, how would you have felt when you hear this kind of um, grumbling? Any thoughts? What gives you right to judge how much I want to pay? So the workers have no right to judge, right? You're the landowner. You decide what you need to give. These are daily wage earners. You decide to be generous to some and you're being fair to the rest. You're not undercutting the six o'clock. You're not paying him half denarius. You pay what was agreed, right? So uh, what gives you the right to judge me? Who is the boss, me or you, right? You're being vexed. Yes, uh, any other responses? Okay, there's contractual salary. We all agreed, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. 
my right to give honor of the of the era. Yes. You may ask yourself, did you do the right thing? Okay. Yeah, thank you for those responses. Yeah. Now, these are some thoughts I want us to think because in on the surface, when you look at this parable, it doesn't make sense. And remember, Jesus begins this parable with a phrase, for the kingdom of heaven is life. Now, is this is this about life in the kingdom of God? Where from my perspective as a worker, right, everything seems unfair. So, Perhaps we need to take a step back and look at the bigger narrative in uh, Matthew chapter 19 and 20. So when we look at chapter 19, we can see the series of events leading up to this parable. Uh, the disciples uh, in chapter 19, verse 13 to verse 15, uh, Jesus, uh, there the are people who bring the little children to Jesus and and the disciples rebuked them. The disciples didn't want the children to come to Jesus. So they were corrected and Jesus corrected. And Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as this. And then Jesus talked about the rich man and the kingdom of God. The rich man was instructed about his failure to keep the law. And he was called to follow uh, Jesus. And the ending of uh, this conversation that Jesus had, that rich man, in Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse 30, has a familiar ring to it. At the end, uh, Jesus said, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. If you look at the ending of this parable, you see the same, right? Uh, the last will be first, and the first will be last. So that gives a clue that uh, this parable of the vineyard workers are tied into the wider narrative in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 19 and chapter 20. And then when you continue on, you also see that Jesus instruct his disciples on the deceit of wealth and the cost of following Jesus. And then came this parable. Okay. And then after this parable, you see uh, Jesus uh, clearly mentioned that Jerusalem is not a place for exaltation, but Jerusalem will be the place where he will be betrayed into the hand of the religious leaders, where he will be handed over to the Gentiles to be mocked, to be flogged, and to be crucified, and he'll rise again. He gave his final uh, prediction, passion prediction. And then after this, you see a mother, the mother of Zebedee came, asking, pleading on behalf of their two, two children, that when Jesus established his kingdom, let the two sons, one sit on the left and one sit to, on the right, and Jesus has to use this opportunity to teach about what it means to be a servant. If you want to be, uh, you, you want to be great, uh, you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom of money. And then it ends with the section of uh, two blind men receive their sight. Now, when you take together chapter 18 and chapter 19, you will see that a lot of uh, sayings of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus during these two chapters focus on reversal of values of the world. Now, what, what does it mean for me to live in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? Which means our values will have to be opposite that of the world to reflect the values of God. So Jesus deals with issue of status, issue of wealth, issue of greed, and issue of discipleship in these two chapters. And it is where uh, I think the parable of the vineyard worker comes into this larger uh, narrative. And bearing in mind, Jesus is uh, going to enter into Jerusalem in chapter 21, and he knows that his time on earth is barely a week away. And so this will be a time of urgency, trying to drum into the disciples that you got to get this right. This is what it means to follow me. This is what it means to live life in the kingdom. Right. So when we look at, back to at this parable again, we see that at not, at, at early in the morning, this vineyard worker went out and looked for laborers to work in his vineyard. He has found what he, whoever that is needed agreed on the salary and he, he sent the workers into the vineyard. Now, as I said, you go back to think about my experience in Pakistan. Uh, if I you put yourself into the shoes of the laborers who are standing there in the marketplace hoping to look for a job. Everyone is taken one by one and you are left behind, nine o'clock. 
what we have gone through your mind. Someone who has been picked up at nine o'clock and you're still waiting until 12 o'clock, what would have gone through your mind? You might think, am I so useless that nobody wants me? If nobody wants me, what will happen to me? Uh, I, I would not have any salary. Would I be able to put food on the table when I reach home in the evening? Would my family have food to eat? You just imagine the, the, the anxiety, the worry, but having food on the table at the end of the day would have consumed those workers. When it comes to three o'clock in the afternoon, you'll probably have given up hope of looking for finding a job. You can only say, well, God have mercy on me. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family. You just imagine the, the, the sense of anxiety. When it comes to five o'clock, sunset at six o'clock, five o'clock, there's no hope. You probably, you probably have to think that I have to pack, my, pack up my things and go home. And then suddenly, this generous vineyard owner came. Hey, you're still here. No one hire you. Never mind. Come. I don't want you to go hungry for this evening. I want to make sure that you have food on your table uh, for your family. Come. Go and work in my vineyard. I'll take care of things. You know? I'll pay you what is right. And notice that there was no mention of what is right. You know? So if, if I'm the five o'clock workers, I'll probably think the, the, the owner might give me a little bit for me to ensure that I have food on my table for my family, that's all. May not be even more. You may expect that you probably get half or maybe a quarter of the pay that, uh, that the six o'clock workers would, have, uh, would be given. But lo and behold, when you come to payment time, and this is where the suspense begins. The owner, the land, uh, vineyard owner, didn't start paying with the six o'clock workers. He has started paying with six o'clock worker one denarius. He walk away. You pay nine o'clock one denarius. They walk away. Nobody will complain. But strangely, he reversed. He started with the last one first. The one who worked one hour. I gave you one denarius. This guy is jumping up with joy because I don't deserve this. And then he gives a uh, when he gives the five o'clock one denarius. You can imagine the three o'clock one. Maybe I'll get more. I also got one. The one who knew, hey, surely I work extra. You work one hour, I work six hours. I deserve six times more. Hey, no, I'm also being paid one. And then the worst one is the six o'clock. You toy and labor 12 hours. You only get one. Whereas the other person work on one hour, he also gets one. And this is what we call unfair, unfair. And I think this parable hit home our attitude. We always cry unfair when we look at others and we find that their plates are full and our plates are empty. And what is interesting is actually in verse 15, the words that Jesus used in verse 15. In verse 15, in this parable, the owner say, Take your, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Huh? Addressing the one who hired at six o'clock. He said, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for one denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Didn't I have the right to do what I want with my own uh, money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Now this phrase, are you envious because I'm generous? If you are using the NIV, the translation trying to bring out the meaning. Are you envious because I'm generous? But if you read the Greek text, literally it means, is your eye evil that I am good? Is your eye evil that I am good? Now, this is a very strong phrase. Is your eye evil that I am good? It cuts through our hearts. We like to look at others. Why God bless that, per that person more than me? Why God heal that person and doesn't heal me? Why does that person always get material blessing from God and not me? In a Jewish understanding, Evil eyes is quite an interesting concept. You can read through a number of Jewish writings, right? Uh, in Sirach, one of the Jewish writings during the intertestamental period, he has this to say, the eye of the greedy person is not satisfied with his share. An evil eye is envious over bread and is lacking on his side. So it means that when I look at your plate, I'm look at my plate, how come your plate is bigger, my plate is smaller? It's not that you have nothing, you have what you need. But you look at others, then you realize that your plate is empty, others has more. And then in the Qumran community, there was actually a saying that says, do not entrust your wealth to a man with an evil eye. So this whole idea of evil eye is, 
I'm not happy with what I got. I never learned to count my blessings. When I look at others, I always count others' blessings, not my blessing. And I'm jealous. And I have this evil eye to complain, to murmur. That's why Jesus told this person, is your eye evil? That I am good. And then Jesus end by saying, the last shall be the first and the first last. Now, what is Jesus teaching us in this parable? As I said earlier on, this parable deals with life in the kingdom. It talks about reversal of value. Now, let's just reflect carefully of all the various workers that have been hired. Six o'clock, nine o'clock, noon, three, five. In our capitalist society, we often think about our worth equals to monetary sense. What is our worth? Our worth is simply because I can work, I can earn a salary, and the more I earn, the more it reflects my worth. My worth is reflected in how much I get. Uh, if I'm an employee, my worth is probably reflected in the designation, the title, or the position that I have, in how big my office is compared to the rest. That is the world that we are living in. But if you think about what this parable that Jesus was saying here, and if you think about it further, who, the, the one who came at five o'clock was the one who doesn't, des who, who, the one who doesn't deserve anything. But yet, the landowner was generous to reach out to this person. Now, if you think carefully about life in the kingdom, as believers, as Christians, aren't, we, aren't all of us are like the 11-hour workers and we are undeserving of what God has given us. If you think about our salvation, more so we are entered into Holy Week and we will reflect the death and the crucifixion of Jesus. We often say, we often reflect during this period that Christ suffered for us. Christ died for our sins because we simply do not deserve it. And I think it's also significant that this parable appears during this season, during this period of time where we are reflecting on Good Friday and Easter. Aren't we all like the 11 hour worker that we don't deserve God's grace and his mercy that he has given us. So friends, sometimes when we think about it, if we are always jealous of others, or we complain about others, or we even entertain the hint that God is unfair, when we look at the blessings that God has given others, the generosity that uh, God has showered upon in others, perhaps we have not truly appreciated what God has done in our lives, and we fail to understand that we ourselves do not even deserve God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness in the first place. I think this parable teaches us how to rejoice with others because you think about it, if I'm a six o'clock worker, I'm being hired. Yes, I may toy hard under the heat, under the sun, but when I'm hired at six o'clock, I know for sure I have food on the table at the end of the evening but the five o'clock workers has given up hope and we don't even think about the anxiety, the anxiousness that this worker would have to go through and endure, wondering whether there will be food on the table, whether they have to go hungry. What if this worker was not hired the day before, which means the family would have been hungry for not one day, but two days. Of course, the parable is silent. I'm just letting my imagination run wild a bit by reflecting on this. So how can this passage help us uh, put our service, our life in the kingdom of God in a proper perspective? Maybe it's good to ask ourselves, have we questioned God about his fairness and generosity? Or do we think that God is unfair? Why this person is, you know, this, this person got it so easy and got it so hard. And what makes us think that God is unfair to us? So how this parable help us in, in our understanding about God. Now, at the end, we are all 11-hour workers. We don't deserve. And God, out of his generosity and his great love, he has redeemed us. Just like he is fair to all. It's only from our perspective that perhaps we have, the, we have this evil eye. We look at others, we will our bit, we have blessed. Some have said, uh, uh, some have, I, I, uh, over the years, uh, uh, some have asked me to share about my own journey, my own testimony, uh, serving God. 
And sometimes one of the questions that came out is how do I view life and uh, as a full-time worker where we receive lower salary and things like that. I will always say God has never been unfair to me. I have more than what I have and I can still give to others. So God has not been unfair to me. In fact, God has blessed me richly in ways that I could not even imagine. You know, sometimes we look at our plate, we find it little. But perhaps we need to look at our plate and see what God has blessed us with and learn to count the blessings that God has showered upon us. Perhaps at this point, before I move to the next parable, in your own simple way, spend maybe the next 30 seconds or a minute to give thanks to God for the blessings that God has showered in your life. Reflect back to your own faith journey, how God has blessed you, how God has been good to you. So in your own ways, may you offer thanksgiving uh, to God. Can we do that uh, in silence for the next few moments? We count our blessings, we give thanks to you that we have no lack. Forgive us, O oh Lord, at times through our evil eyes when we look at others, we've forgotten that our plate runneth over, our plate is full, and yet we are blinded by this fact and we see others having a bigger plate. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and help us to count the blessings that you have given us so that our hearts will always be full of thanksgiving and gratitude to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, let me now move on to Matthew chapter 24 and chapter 25. Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, this, this two chapters is what we often call the Olivet Discourse. And the reason why it's called Olivet is because this conversation that Jesus had with his disciples as recorded in Matthew 24, 25, uh, was done on Mount of Olives. If you were able to visit Jerusalem today, or perhaps I, 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 some of you who have been, you will recall back Mount of Olives, where the Garden of Gethsemane is, where the Church of Paternoster is, uh, where you would have walked down the Palm Sunday Road. Now, as you walk down the Palm Sunday road that Jesus would have done uh, 2,000 years ago, this view that you see on the screen would have greeted you. And in this screen, when you look at it, uh, you will see the temple. Now, today, what you see here is a temple mount. You will see the Awa Aksa Mosque, and you will see the Dome of the Rock. So you have to use your imagination a little bit. This would have been the temple in the first century. Pilgrims of old, when they enter the temple, most of them will have climbed up the steps, as you can see here. The steps here, and this is what we call the from the southern gate, the steps that you have climbed up here, and you enter into the temple courts, and the sanctuary would have been here. The holy place would have been here. This would have been the courts of women. So you just have to imagine the temple view uh, greeting you as you walk up uh, Mount Olive and then you descend uh, on the way to Jerusalem. As pilgrim of old, you would have uh, uh, walked on foot for hours, for days, as you make your way uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So this would have been the view you have seen from Mount of Olives. So you just have to imagine that you are the disciples of Jesus. Hearing Jesus uh, talk about uh, Matthew 24, 25, on Mount of Olives, this would have been the view that they would have as they were on Mount of Olives. Now, as we reflect on uh, these two chapters, now let me just uh, suggest that when we look at these two chapters, these two chapters deals with the two questions that the disciple asked Jesus. So if you look at Matthew chapter 24, it gives us the context, right? where Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. 
As Jesus came out of the temple and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him the building of the temple. And he asked them, You see all this, do you not? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another, and it all will be thrown down. So you just imagine the disciple when they let when they read and, and Jesus when they were leaving the temple, they would have walked down the steps as well. So the disciples have looked back and point out to Jesus, look at this temple, this magnificent building. Uh, so beautiful. And how does the temple in the first century look like? So if you to visit the Israel Museum, there is a model that is being reconstructed based on descriptions from various uh, sources. And this would have been what the temple looked like. So the disciples have walked down the southern steps here. And this will be the row of shops where there'll be money changers, those who sell girls. So if you come out, you walk up here. These are the steps you walk out. And this will be the courts of Gentile, this will be the holy place, uh, courts of women. So this is a temple that Herod the Great expanded. And they've taken many years to do so. Now, when they walk out here, they'll point out Jesus. So beautiful, this temple. You look at this, you know. So this will be the view from Mount Olives. As you mentioned, if you're Mount Olives, this view would have greeted you. And then, you look at this temple, so beautiful, so grand. And Herod actually employed 10,000 workers, including 1,000 priests in the construction of the temple. So if you read John chapter 22, where Jesus said that destroy this temple, I'll build it in three days. They were saying, hey, for 46 years, this temple had been under construction. So you can imagine the construction of the temple has been going on for decades. And while Jesus was on earth, the, the temple has not actually completed yet. It is completed, but they are still putting up some touches. It's not only after uh, 30 years after Jesus that the temple was fully completed, the practical completion of the temple. And building of this temple may not necessarily be religious, but it is very political because Herod wanted to garner support from the Jewish people. That's why he enlarged the temple. And one of the builders of the temple is known as Simon. So interestingly, we have his uh, usuri that has been discovered and it's now on display in Israel Museum. So if you go to Israel Museum, you can see this Uzri and the words that has written on his Uzri, that where you kept the, uh, his body that has been decomposed. Uh, so the bones will be kept in this Uzri. It was written here, Simon builder of the temple and dates back to the first century. So Simon must be really a proud Jewish uh, builder. And he, in his tombstone, he described himself as Simon the Temple Builder. And he must have been so, so proud of being one of the 10,000 who have built this temple. And Josephus described the temple in this manner. The stones is gold trimmed and gold covered roof of the temple sanctuary. Make the temple mount look like a snow-capped mountain and it was a blinding sight. A rabbi once says this, he who have seen the temple in his full splendor, he, he who have not seen the temple in his full splendor has never seen a beautiful building in his life. Well, just like any visitors to KL, you tell them you have not seen the Twin Towers, you have not seen Kuala Lumpur, or, or you have not seen the Eiffel Tower, you have not been to Paris, uh, that kind of idea. So that's what the rabbis say. If you have not seen the temple, you have not seen what a building is like. Everybody has... Uh, glowing description of the temple. But for Jesus, he's not impressed. He's not impressed with the architectural wonder. And Jesus is more concerned what goes on in the temple. And the temple was corrupted. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, late, uh, early on, a few verses, Jesus had said these words, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus wept for Jerusalem because Jerusalem, the temple itself, the, that is supposed to draw people to worship God is now corrupted. The temple has become an institution where you have all the rituals that goes on, but there's no life in it. And the religious leaders, the high priests, the chief priests of the day, rob people 
rob the widows. And they're supposed to be people that defend the marginalized. In fact, they rob from them. And Jesus wept. And that is why when the disciple uh, said, look at this building, so beautiful. And Jesus told them, truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on one another. Everyone will be thrown down. And true enough, Jesus would have said these words in the early 30s. And fast forward 30 over years later, in the year 70, the Roman authority destroyed the temple completely. And the temple was completely destroyed. And to commemorate the destruction of the temple, if you go to Rome today, and if you look out for the Arch of Titus, it's located not too far from the Roman Forum in the heart of the uh, city of Rome. You can see the Arch of Titus as you walk underneath it, look up, and you can see uh, the menorah that is being carried away. And this arch commemorates the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. And it's still left standing today. So the Jews will be forever reminded that Jerusalem, including the temple, has been destroyed in fulfillment of what Jesus prophesies in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 and 2. So after Jesus mentioned about the destruction of Jerusalem, right, in verse 3, uh, they walked down from the uh, temple, they have walked through the Kidron Valley, and they have gone up to Mount Olives. Uh, in verse 3, we read, when he was sitting on the Mount Olives, the disciple came to him privately saying, tell us, when will this be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Notice these two questions. The first question is, they ask, when will the destruction of Jerusalem temple be? Number two, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they are concerned with this question. So as they leave Jerusalem, this will be the view of Mount Olives today. And Jesus would have traveled Mount Olives. And when they are out of Mount Olives, they turn around, they would have seen the view of the Jerusalem temple as what you have seen here. And so they asked Jesus, Jesus, you talk about this temple that's going to be destroyed. Tell us, what is the sign? When will it be? What is the sign of the end of age? So there are two questions. One that deals with them immediately, the destruction of the temple. One is further away. What will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And so Matthew 24, 25 deals with this, we deal with the conversation that Jesus had with disciples in answering the two questions. Now, interestingly, Jesus never answered them uh, the exact time of when he will come. Uh, the disciple asked them, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Jesus just told them these few things. You read Matthew 24. Jesus gave them the signs. There'll be famine, there'll be earthquake, you know, uh, but all those things, there'll be false messiah, but all those things Jesus told them, beware. You've got to know what's coming and do not be alarmed, do not be afraid. There'll be false messiah, there'll be natural disaster, there'll be wars, there'll be conflict, there'll be persecution, there'll be betrayal. And yet the gospel will be preached. That means there will be the expansion of the kingdom. But Jesus only tell them, what is the exact time hour? No one will know. No one will know. Now, what is interesting in this conversation that Jesus had, he wrapped it up. Uh, in the end of chapter 24 and the rest of chapter 25 by giving them a series of, this, of, of parables. So what Jesus was trying to do is not only to warn the disciples and to tell them that these are some of the things that will happen. There'll be earthquake, there'll be famine, there'll be natural disasters, you will be persecuted. But through it all, how are you going to live your life? And Jesus explained it through four parables towards the end of his conversation. And that is to encourage the disciples, and to and by extension, all of us as well. How do we how do we live our life in light of the second coming of Jesus, and how do we face and confront uh, suffering and evil in our present day? And basically, the message of Jesus throughout all this Oliver discourse is to watch and be on your guard, so that you are not led astray. So let us continue to be faithful disciples of Jesus. And despite all this, the, the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God will continue to grow. When will Jesus come? We don't know, but Jesus tells us 
be on your guard. And this is what you're going to do. Live your life in light of his second coming again. So how then shall we live? And this is where uh, Jesus gave us a series of parables. Uh, there, are, there are four of them, which we're going to look at briefly. There's a parable of a faithful and wise servant, parable of the wise and foolish virgins, parable of the talents, and parable of the sheep and goat. So these four parables are men all mentioned in Matthew 24, 25. And to able to get its message, I think we've got to look at all these four parables at the same time so that we get the big picture of what Jesus was telling us. How should we live our life in light of his second coming? And uh, how do we face and confront uh, evil and suffering in our present age? How are we to guard ourselves? Okay, let's look at the first parable. Parable of the faithful and wise servant. Okay, I'm going to read to you from verse 45, chapter 24, verse 25. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? You'll be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. True, I tell you, he will be put in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day where he does not expect him and an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where will be weeping and gnashing of tea. So in this parable, we see that the master is going away. We don't know when he's going to come. It's the analogous of Jesus after his uh, resurrection and his ascension, we know that he has returned to the Father, but he will come again one day. We just do not know when. But interestingly, when you zoom into this parable, uh, Jesus talked about this particular servant. This servant uh, that the master has put him in charge over other servants. Now, and then in this parable, Jesus talked about two possible scenarios. One, this can be a wise and faithful servant if he continued to discharge his responsibility well. And what is his responsibility? This servant right, will be put in charge of all his possession. And this servant uh, will take care of other servants. Look at verse 45 to give them their food at the proper time, which means he's like a chief servant. He's supposed to take care of the master possession and he's supposed to take care of all other servants by feeding them and giving them food at its proper time. So that means to say, what Jesus was saying, this is actually a chief servant. That means someone that is in charge of overall running of the property and the other servants within a household of this rich master. And this servant, if he does so, he will be wise and faithful. But however, if he's abused his position of trust, where uh, he thinks that the master is going away for a long time, so he can do what he likes, he beat up other servants, and he went out to eat and drink with the drunkards, but did not feed them, one day the master come back to hold him accountable. So the choice is this servant. It's the same person. He can be known as wise and faithful, or he can be known as wicked. So what is the choice? Knowing that the master will soon return and the servant has to give an account to the master of his own behavior and of the trust that's been entrusted to him to discharge his responsibility, to take care of other servants and to take care of the possessions of the household. So what is expected of the servant? If he's wise and faithful, he will carry out his duty. Now, the question is, this servant is in charge of other servants. So what is Jesus saying? That means to say, it is the head of the household. It's a head of this family. By extension, when we think about ap application today, what is Jesus saying to us? Could Jesus also be addressing us who are pastors, who are leaders, who are, who are people of influence in the church, that God has entrusted this responsibility to us? It could be a pastor. It could be... Uh, uh, an elder or a deacon. It could be a Sunday school teacher. It could be a ministry leader. The thing is, God has entrusted to us. How are we discharging this 
responsibility. And I think that is important for us to reflect that when God called us to serve him, he entrusted this responsibility to us to feed others, to shepherd others as well. So have we discharged our duty or what has been entrusted to us diligently and faithfully? What if this servant fails in giving food to others? Jesus said in this parable, when the master returned and find that he has not been faithful, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. There'll be weeping and gnashing of it. Not a very good picture that you see here. Right? So the ending can be very gloomy, uh, can be rather scary as well. So again, you see, this parable tells us that the master is going away. He will definitely come back. We can think about it. It's like Jesus going away. He will come back as he called each one of us to serve him in whatever capacity. Are we faithful in discharging whatever responsibility that God has entrusted to us? Or have we abused the position that God has given us? And if that in the case, there are severe consequences, consequences awaiting us. Now, I was feeling a little bit down the last couple of weeks, partly because I uh, heard of a pastor, a colleague in the ministry, uh, whose marriage broke down and subsequently had a third person in the relationship. And the wife was asked to move out from the house and subsequently he has to be removed from his position. That was a sad case. You know? So we all... So if there's anything, this parable warned us, whether we are leaders, we are pastors, as we have been entrusted by God to feed our flock, have we abused the sacred trust that God has given us? And so there's something for us to pause and to reflect. Now, I'd like to move on to the next parable, which is the parable of wise of foolish virgin. And I also realize I've been talking for one hour already, about one hour already. Uh, maybe I'll just give all of us a two, three minutes break in case you need to stretch yourself, get a drink or a toilet break. So we'll just probably take a two, three minutes break and I'll continue on with three other parables. And at the end of it, I'll give some time for questions and answers. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Uh, so uh, Yu Yong had posted the, the link to the Slido, uh, uh, to Slido where you can type in your question. Feel free to do so. I'll just pause for a couple of minutes. Uh, I also need to take a drink. And so I'll come back in a couple of minutes. So if you need to stretch yourself, uh, yeah, please feel free to do so. All right. Thank you, Reverend. So yes, so the Slido link is uh, posted. Also, I have uh, just posted the Google form uh, for the feedback. So if you could, could you kindly just uh, fill it up for us to help us improve. Also, this is the primary way in which we are collecting your email addresses so that we will send you the slides. Uh, so yeah, we'll see you in about uh, two to three minutes. So for those of you who are interested, this is uh, Reverend Dr. Lim Kang Yong's book on following Jesus. So if you are interested, it's uh, 75 ringgit plus 5 ringgit for shipping for a copy. Uh, so do take note that this is a promotional price. It will end on 15 April 2021. So if you're interested, please scan the QR code.
friends. We'll be resuming in about uh, 30 seconds or so. So again, we appreciate it if you could kindly help fill up the feedback form. And also do post any questions that you have, uh, either from the session or from the parables. Uh, you can use a Slido link. Uh, if you are not familiar with it, you can message me privately. Uh, I can put in the questions for you. Okay, let us resume. So I'll just pass the time back to uh, Reverend Dr. Lim Kayong. Hey, welcome back. And we will continue on with Matthew chapter 25. A very familiar parable. Uh, I'm going to read to you from verse 1 to verse 13. Chapter 25, verse 1 to verse 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like. Again, you see the phrase, the kingdom of heaven will be like. It will be like 10 virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamb, uh, but did not take any oil with them. And the wise one, however, took oil in jars along with their lambs. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all become drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lambs, and the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lambs are going out. No, they replied, they may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the bank wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And this is the second parable in the series. And as I said just now, as I read, it begins with the kingdom of heaven is light. Now, what is this kingdom of heaven is light? Uh, one of the clues that you, that you can read and understand parable is to always look at the ending, how the ending ends. And if you look at verse 13, this is how it ends. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day of the hour. So that is actually tell us that is the point of parable. Keep watch because you do not know the day of the hour. So if that is what Jesus said this parable is supposed to mean, how do we understand it? Now, this is where it gives us a safeguard, lah, like a, 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 a frame for us to understand this parable so that we won't uh, interpret out of the context. Right? So throughout the history of uh, interpreting this particular parable, there's a lot of problems here. I, I'm not going to go in, into details, but if you look at the ending, and which we call end stress, uh, we can actually see where what this parable was trying to emphasize. Now, this parable says that no one knows the time or the hour, therefore keep watch. How can we keep watch? It means that we are not abandoned our uh, obligation, just like we read earlier on in the end of chapter 24. And how does that link up to the parable of the faithful servant? This particular parable, Jesus said, just like the bridegroom, the bridegroom can come back anytime. The bridegroom can come back even at midnight when he is least expected. But your task is to keep watch and be ready because you do not know the time. Now, interestingly, in this parable, there are two groups of people. One group prepared oil, the other did not. Now, if you look at the oil lamp that's being used in the first century, they are not big oil lamp that you see today. They actually, you can just hold it in your hand and they're pretty small. And what you pour is you just pour oil in it, put a wick in and you light. And this oil lamp that you hold in your hand will probably not be enough to sustain a very long period of time. So how are you going to be prepared for the long haul? Now, if this lamp can only last you one or two hours, the oil that is in it can only last for one to two hours, it would mean that you have to bring along extra oil if you anticipate that there might be potential delay. That's why it's called the wise virgin because they bring along extra oil. They knew that what if the bridegroom is going to be delayed? 
we have some extra oil. And if you look at the Jewish marriage custom, sometimes things can be delayed. I mean, even in our own wedding custom, you know, right? Uh, let's be honest, like, when you go to wed uh, wedding dinners, right? Wedding banquets, huh? which one says start on time? The wedding invitation says 6.30 sharp, 7 o'clock sharp. You'll be lucky if it's like 8 o'clock. You know, that kind of thing. It's never on time. So you think it's going to start, start at 7 o'clock sharp? You'll be wise to have a little bit of meal first before you go to the uh, wedding banquet in case you get hungry. Lah. You know, that's how we prepare. No? We eat a bit first, we go, knowing that it's going to start late, 8 o'clock, 8.30. So we might be hungry. Now, likewise, the wise one prepared. But remember, this oil lamp are just something you hold in the palm of your hands. And they're not big ones. And you know that there might be potential delay and you didn't prepare. That means you are not wise at all. So of course, the other stories that add in colors, like, hey, give us some oil, you know, ask the foolish one, ask the wise one, and the wise one, we may not have enough. Is it the wise one shellfish? No, I don't think that's really the point. The point is that it really shows there are some very wise ones who are prepared, the one who are not prepared. And Jesus said, keep watch because you do not know uh, the hour, the day, or the hour. And if you are not prepared, then judgment only awaits you. And that is a warning for us. The warning is that we must be prepared for the long haul. The, the, the coming of Jesus may be delayed, yet he will surely come at midnight at the time where we least expect him. So this parable focuses on our preparedness. You know? How are we going to keep watch? How are we going to prepare ourselves? Uh, waiting for the coming of our master. So how do we live our life in light of the second coming? Are we prepared for the long haul? We don't know. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next year. We just don't know when. Are we prepared? Or are we like the other, uh, are we saying, ah, Jesus, everyone talking about Jesus is coming back soon. Ah, it won't happen now. The soon becomes soon and soon and soon. You know, how many more years? How many generations? 2,000 years we have been waiting, but we never know. Midnight is very clear when it clock strike midnight, the bridegroom arrives. Are we prepared? So that will be the question in this uh, parable. Now, as we move on, the other third parable in this series is the parable of the talents. Now, let me read verse 14, huh? chapter 25, verse 14. Again, uh, when you see the word again, you know that the narrative is continuing. Again, it will be like a man uh, going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I gained five. Five more. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The one who have two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, are you new? I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you know that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you shall put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if you look at this parable, the third in the series, you can see the thread already, right? The first one, parable of the wise and the faithful servant, uh, uh, the, the wise and the faithful servant, right? You talk about master going away, 
for a long time, the master come back. The parable of the wise and foolish virgin, the bridegroom uh, is coming, but it's delayed, he came. And now the parable of the talent, uh, again, a man is going on a journey and trusted uh, wealth into the servants. And then he's gone for a long time, he returned. So you can see someone going away, someone returning or someone is being delayed or going away for a long time, but he will surely return. If you look at this parable, it's actually quite interesting because this parable builds up uh, 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 the, 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 uh, the narrative involving three persons. And what is interesting is that in this particular uh, parable, you see the word talent is being used. In the latest NIV translation, it used the bags of gold. But uh, in the Greek word, it's actually talent. Now, talent is a lot of money. Let's not think that one is given five, one is given two, one is given one. The one has only one and is little. No, the one is actually a lot. Talent, one talent equals to 600 denarii. One denarii equals to one day's salary. That means one talent's worth 20 years of salary. You do your math. Let's say you take our minimum wage in Malaysia, right? Just assuming it's 10,000 per year. 10,000 per year, you talk about 20 years salary, that is about 200,000 ringgit. Hey, which master will give me 200,000 ringgit in cash and tell me, hey, can you please take care of it? So there's even one talent that is a lot of money. A lot, a lot of money. And interestingly, if you look at it, and when this money, whether it's five, it's two or one that's been given, if you look at verse 15, it was given each according to his ability. So the amount distributed is based on their ability. That means the master know that this person can do more, I give him more. This person can do less, I give him that. So the master is being fair. Right? Now, the charge of the master is very simple. Put the money to work. And if you look at the narrative, there are three servants, right? The first, put the money to work and double the amount. The second, also put the money to work and double the amount. Now, if you have this narrative in your mind, it comes to the third one, what do you expect the third to do? If you're the hearers, right? Uh, first one got five, uh, double the amount become 10. Second one got two, double the amount become four. So the third one, you will naturally expect that the third one will also double amount from one to become two. And the master gave them according to their ability, which means if five can multiply five, two can multiply two, the one should be able to multiply one as well. So that will be the flow of the narrative. But instead, uh, what we find is that, no, the third servant didn't do that. He failed. He has, been he has given according to his ability. If the rest can multiply by two, surely he can, but he didn't do it. And when the, uh, uh, the master come back uh, and they settled the account, the first servant uh, presented what he has done. The master said, you good and faithful servant. Second one also, you good and faithful servant. Now, if this story were to have a happy ending, it would mean that the third also multiply uh, his one talent, become two talents, and the master will say, you good and faithful servant. But unfortunately, the third didn't do it. And he didn't do it according to his ability. So he was called wicked and lazy. Good and faithful, wicked and lazy. So you can see uh, the contrast here. And so in this particular parable, what Jesus was trying to tell us is that we are to be faithful in the use of whatever gifts or talents that God has given us, regardless of how much the Lord has entrusted to us. You know, sometimes we like to compare, well, this person very talented. Lah. No, surely he can serve God. Now, don't ask me to serve God. I don't have talent. Lah. I cannot do one. Uh, that's not quite right. You know, God has... An God has showered us. Surely we can do something. Unfortunately, within the church setting, we often let the extrovert run the show. You know, like if you're extrovert, you have no, you have no problem going out the stage to be the, to be the worship leader or to be the preacher. But if we are introverted, it takes a lot out of us to stand in front of the public. Perhaps we can find our place in the church, you know, to pray for someone, to give encouragement, uh, to share a message of love with someone, we can all do something in the church. God has given all of us be, uh, wonderful resources in the church. And God has blessed us with spiritual gifts and gifts of people so that together as a body of Christ, we can build up the church. So the challenge for us is whatever resources that God has given us, whatever gifts that God has given us, if you read Corinthians, now the Spirit gives different gifts right? according 
to what the Spirit gives. That means when the Spirit gives us, we have certain gifts. And what God has given us, how have we been using them for His glory? Right? So all of us, may we be encouraged to serve the Lord and to make full use of whatever God has given us, whether it be our gifts, it's our talent, those of us who can preach, make, preach it. Those of us who can teach, teach it. Those of us who can lead worship, lead it well. And those of us who can encourage, let us encourage one another. Those of us who can keep things in order in administrative work, do so and do it well. And those of us who, you know, who, who, who can visit people and who can pray for others, do it well. So all of us in the body of Christ, whether we are the eye, we are the hand, we are the feet, we all have a role uh, to pray. Right? So may we be encouraged to serve God and to encourage one another so that we make full use of whatever talents that God has given us and multiply that. Be the good and faithful uh, servant. Now, if you see the flow, you can see what uh, uh, the Oliver discourse is all about. He talked about us being faithful, responsibly, perhaps for some of us who are in charge of certain things. Uh, Barber of wise and foolish virgins, is a responsibility of all of us to be prepared for the long haul. And parable of talents remind us that God has showered all of us with gifts. We are to multiply them. We are to make full use of that. So all these talk about our responses uh, within the body of Christ, our responses to one another. Our respons- uh, it talk about us, you know, that we are to be faithful in discharging our duties. We are to be prepared for the long haul. We are to be good stewards of what God has given us. So it talks about us. You know, it's a bit more inward looking, right? If you look at it. But when you come to the final parable, which is the parable of a sheep and goats uh, in the Oliver Discourse, you see that the focus is slightly different. It's not about us. The focus is on outreach, right? Let us turn to the last parable, uh, the parable of the sheep and goat. Uh, Let us read um, Matthew 25, verse uh, 31. Matthew 25, verse uh, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. When the king, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was imprisoned and you came to visit me. Then the righteous answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes or clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will turn to those on his left. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick in prison and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did you... We see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison and did not help you. He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And this parable is a slight shift. Now, if you look at the earlier three parables, right, it all talk about the master went away, the master will return. The bridegroom is coming, but is delayed. Now, the master go away and return. Talk about uh, 
uh, anticipating the coming of the master. When in this particular last parable, the scenes open with the judgment scene. Uh, the son of man has come his glory ready and it's judgment time. Now, interestingly, in this party judgment, uh, the people is separated to two, uh, the sheep and like a sheep and the goat. And, and the point that Jesus mentioned in this parable is this, you know, the, the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed and take your inheritance. And then he follows by this six category of people that Jesus mentioned in his parable. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, uh, you looked after me. And I was in prison, you visited me. And then this writer said, hey, Lord, when, when, when do we do all those things? We don't even see you in the hung, uh, among the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked. What have we done? And, and in this parable, the king says, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least." of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. So they were welcome. And then to another group, uh, they didn't do anything. So they also asked the king, okay, when do we see you hungry? When do you see you thirsty? When do you see you a stranger? No, we didn't do all the things. We didn't ever see you. Therefore, we didn't do it. And the king said, I tell you, whatever you did not do, for one of the least of this, you did not do unto me. I reflect that that's quite powerful. Now, who are this group of people represented here? The hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the prisoner, the marginal. They are probably people who are marginalized, people who are less fortunate than us. And in this parable, it's interesting because early on, as I said, the other three parables focus on us. Are we ready? Are we prepared for the long haul? How are we going to discharge our responsibility? How are we going to make use of the resources of talents that God has given us? But suddenly, this last parable, the focus is outward, maybe. It tells us to focus on others. It tells us to focus on the, the poor, uh, the stranger, the naked, the sick, those in prison. That means we are to reach out to these people. Now, who are one of the least of these brothers and sisters in now meets today. And the challenge for us is to go and reach out to these people. So when you talk about Christian discipleship, Christian discipleship is not talking about our worship of God, our own journey of taking our cross and following Jesus. It's not about us uh, strengthening our discipleship by coming to classes such as this, although this is absolutely important. We do all this very well in the church, but we often short, fall short because we have not lifted our eyes beyond the four walls of the church and looked at the world around us. Who are one of the least of these brothers and sisters in our midst today? Now, if you take this four par series of parables together, you know, if we didn't do the last one, which is this one, parable of sheep and goat, to care for the marginalized, they fail in our discipleship because this has to be taken in the same series, in the same breath because it is told one after another. And it started with the master being delayed, delayed, delayed now, judgment time. I think this is significant for us to reflect uh, that reaching out in works of mercy, works of compassion, social ministry is important in the church. In fact, it should be intrinsic part of the church, not something that is addendum to it. Who are they? I'm quite glad in PJEFC you have done many great and wonderful things. You have done a lot of outreach uh, to the poor, to the marginalized. Uh, you have a number of projects that's ongoing and I really commend you for that. That is really wonderful. And as all of us think together, how can we reach out to these people even more? How are we to go? And what are we to do for one of the least of these brothers and sisters? Of course, the need of of the world is there, more so during the current pandemic. How are we to strategize? How are we to prioritize? And one of the uh, questions that I've always asked myself is this, when we look at one another, and when we look at the world around us, do we see Christ in the disfigured faces of the unfortunate, the marginalized, and the voiceless of our society that we might be moved to serve them, to serve him through them. And you think about it, if we truly believe that all of us are created in the image of God, when we see one of the less fortunate, do we see 
God in them, the image of God, because they are created in the image of God. Whether they are believers or not, how are we going to reach out to them? How are we going to, to make sure that we can be a voice for them? Uh, we can reach out to them. Uh, we can play a role uh, for them. Yes, we can pray for them. Uh, we can give money. We can give offering. But what can we do beyond that? Can we, be, can we move into the area of advocacy? Can we move in the area of where well, become a voice uh, to speak on behalf of them? So think about it. There are many things that we could do. So if you take a step back and look at all these four parables, we can see there is a thread that throughout, right? It talks of, uh, we have covered the parable of the faithful and wise servant. It talks us, it tells us to be faithful. We have looked at the parable of the wise and foolish virgin. It tells us to be wise so that we are ready for the long haul. We look at the parables of the talents that remind us to be resourceful. And finally, the parable of the sheep and goat. We are to be compassionate. Let me suggest, if we didn't do the last part well and we failed in our entire discipleship, our Christian discipleship is not about me and myself, but ultimately is reaching out. The kingdom of heaven is like, how are we going to spread the love of the kingdom of heaven, the love of Christ to all that is around us? So oftentimes, as I said, we do well in our faithfulness. We do well being wise. We do well in managing our resources. But we can easily fail to be compassionate to the marginalized and those who suffer injustice. May God have mercy on us you know, as we reflect on this series of parables. How do we live life in the kingdom of heaven? And as I said, uh, in this particular uh, Oliver discourse, the most important part is, you see that I skip all the part about um, all the warnings that talks about uh, the day unknown, that talk about uh, 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 the earthquake and all the, uh, all the calamities. Uh, because there's a lot of interpretation of this. Right? But my take is, is just simply this. This Oliver discourse is not written to satisfy our curiosity who will be the Antichrist la, when will Jesus come. What the main focus of the Oliver discourse is how we should live our life. Matthew warns us, he exhorts us, he encourages us to live out our faith in the light of the second coming of Christ. Just like the disciples have to live their faith in light of the destruction of Jerusalem, we too in light of the second coming of Christ. Matthew warns us, be aware, be aware, you do not know the time, but it tells us how we are to live our life. We are to be faithful. We are to be wise. We are to be resourceful. And finally, we are to be compassionate. And not to forget the first parable they looked at. We are to learn to count our blessing and giving thanks to God for his generosity toward us. So that whatever we receive from God, that his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his generosity, that we may share with others as well. If there's anything I think is what life in the kingdom of heaven is all about, according to to the Gospel of Matthew. And with that, I'll probably just end uh, my session here and I'll be more than happy to take any uh, questions uh, and answers. Uh, Yu Yong has been promoting my book. If you would like to get a copy, uh, just scan the QR code. It will lead you to a form that you can fill out. Then you come to me. I'll respond to you uh, uh, accordingly if you're interested. Uh, to get hold of the book um, and to help you in your reflection, particularly during this season of time about the life and the ministry of Jesus. Yeah, so I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I'll stop sharing and yeah, back to you, Yong. Okay, thank you, Reverend Dr. Lim Ka Yong. All right, so what we'll be doing is that I'll give uh, you guys about a minute or two to fill out the questions. Uh, at this point of time, I'll just be uh, sharing the slides uh, for the info. Uh, for the uh, for the book, uh, so one or two, I already saw one or two questions on the slide already. Uh, so just want to give you all a minute or two uh, to uh, just, just write your questions. Uh, also, if you're interested to purchase the book, just scan the QR. It's uh, quite direct once you have uh, gone to there. So yeah, uh, we'll be responding to the questions in a minute or two. Also, if you can, uh, just fill up the form uh, via the Google form links that I sent. Thank you so much to those who have uh, sent it in. Yeah, we've noted your response and you will help us improve.
Okay. All right. So we'll be addressing the question and answers. Okay. All right, there are two questions at this moment. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 51, it mentions that the foolish servants will be cut in pieces, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Does that mean that they will lose their salvation? Okay, thank you uh, for that uh, question. Now, one of the things when we read parables, uh, I will always suggest that we treat it a bit more care because parable doesn't, it's not something we use to, 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 to build doctrines. Parables are meant, are stories that are told, they are meant to shock the hearers, right? They are meant to shock the hearers. Uh, sometimes parable has a lot of exaggeration. In fact, you look at some of the parables that Jesus said, you scratch your head, this is impossible, cannot be one. But it's mentioned to make a point, just like we look at the parable of wise and foolish virgin. Midnight, hey, we don't have it now, I go to the shop and buy. Which shop is open? At midnight in the first century, there's no 7 Eleven during those days. So there's no 24 hour joint. Every shop will be closed by sunset. So it's impossible. So there's a lot of things that is impossible in the parable. But I think the point that it's making is that if you don't do all this, there are severe consequences. Now, whether one will lose our salvation, it's hard for me to answer because that lies in the hands of God who makes a final judgment, uh, if I can answer that. Huh? All right, thank you. All right, so uh, the next question, is there any significance in Matthew chapter 25, verse 24, uh, describing the master as a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed? Okay, uh, uh, if there's anything in this particular parable, it re probably reflects the attitude of the servant. Because if you look at it, the flow, right? The first servant, you, uh, I gave you five, right? He went and multiplied. He didn't raise any question, right? And then for the second servant, I gave you two, he went and multiplied, he didn't ask any question. But the third one, uh, he didn't do anything. He probably sees that uh, the, uh, the rest of his colleague has multiplied. So that's his reason. Hey, master, I know la, you're, you are the people like that. La, therefore, uh, so it's probably part of his excuse, uh, trying to justify why he didn't multiply. It's just like us, la, we can excuse. I, uh, no, I don't have this talent. I am uh, not good enough. You know, we can justify a lot of things. Uh, so I'll probably see it more like uh, his justification because you don't see it in the other two uh, servants that respond uh, that way. Okay, thank you. All right, so there are two questions in uh, by this uh, in, in one. Uh, first is, uh, will we lose our salvation if we do not think, do the things as described in the parables? Uh, and second, is there an ebook version of your book? Okay, uh, whether can we lose our salvation? I said, um, I, I really, okay, we can, I can only say certain things based on the scriptures, but ultimately God is the one. And I think God will look at all of us, you know, uh, during the judgment day. And it's hard for me. Now, let me just say this. If you are fearful of losing your salvation, chances are that you won't lose it because you will do what is right, you know. It's, <laughs> that's how I will see it. Like, if that can be a bit of encouragement. We all are fearful, uh, you know, what will happen. But let me encourage us that we, as we live our life faithfully in serving the Lord, you know, and prepare ourselves for the second coming of Christ. Uh, there's no reason why. Huh? Like that. Now, is there an ebook? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the book, when it's published by the publisher, everything is done by the publisher. I have no control at all. And so the publisher at this point in time decided not to do any ebook, unfortunately, even though I've been asking the, the, the publisher whether they will consider doing it. And the answer that I got at this point in time is no, they are not. Uh, too keen. So that lies in the hand of publisher. And my rights have been surrendered to the publisher, I think, I can't remember, seven years or whatever years, I can't remember. Uh, so if, if I want to publish an ebook, I have to wait until the period of the rights I've given to the publisher has expired, then maybe I will consider doing an ebook later on. Yeah, thanks for that. Unfortunately, it, 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 the decision lies with the publisher and whether whatever we want to say, uh, whatever decision made by the publisher is often commercially driven. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my, my, I, I, my hands are tied. I can't do much. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there is another question, but it's in the Zoom chat. This is, uh, I noticed that the question about the outer wilderness is a painful topic. In Matthew, this is mentioned more than once. It is possible that while we are saved by God, uh, doesn't want us in his presence. 
uh, well, as I said, uh, parables sometimes are meant to shock a hearer. So sometimes the picture that's painted is so gloomy that you, when you listen to it, you got a shock. So when you got a shock, you begin to think and say, okay, uh, I, I got to do something about my own life right now. So parable has this function. And Matthew tend to talk about this, about weeping and gnashing of peace. And you're quite right that it appears uh, a number of times. Now, if you take a step back, right, and look at the purpose of Matthew uh, as a big picture, now, most scholars believe that Matthew, uh, that this gospel is actually written for a Jewish audience. And that reflects because Matthew didn't want to use the word phrase kingdom of God, but kingdom of heaven. And, and it's very clear that uh, Matthew has, uh, this gospel is written to the Jews to prove the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. And perhaps the language would be stronger to warn the Jews, because if you look at the history of the Jewish nation, uh, nation, Israel as a nation from the Old Testament until the New Testament time. How many times have, have God's chosen people rebelled against him? You look at the wilderness uh, as a wandering 40 years, what did they do? Golden calf, they disobeyed a lot. You know? And you look at, you read, you, you, and then you look at the, the, the period, you look at the times of the judges, how they have rebelled against God. Then you look at the time of their exile. God has warned them so many times, you know, repent, repent, but they refused, and exile was a consequence for it. And so if you look at it, so I'm not surprised that you, this kind of phrase you see is much more stronger in Matthew, but you don't see in Mark or John, you don't see really that kind of strong a warning that's given. Perhaps Matthew is also warning his fellow Jewish uh, audience that please take heed what God is saying to you just like what the prophets of old has done. You are a stiff-necked people. So that's why the language come out a bit more stronger. And I think it has to do partly with the audience that Matthew is writing to as well, like that put it in its proper historical uh, context. So I hope that um, that answers your question. So. Okay, and um, thank you. That's another question. Is there a fine line between, between obeying Jesus to reach out to the marginalized and thinking that that will solve the world's problems of uh, sin of men? Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, uh, I don't think we are, we are called to be a messiah to solve the problems of the world. But I think whatever little that we can do, uh, it does make a difference. So that's why uh, when we think about our own community, we, we always think about the church that is within a community. What can we do for our community? So I don't think we are called to, okay, let's say if we have the resources to reach out to other parts of the world, by all means, we can do so. But more often than that, that is where the local church is called a local church. It is a church located in that particular area. So we have churches located in very poor area. Uh, they have done great work in reaching out. One of my colleagues in, in church that I serve uh, has a parish in Oakland Road reaching out to the very poor in the community. Uh, single mothers reaching out, uh, helping, them, uh, uh, helping them to survive drug addicts, uh, uh, reaching out to particularly ethnic group uh, that is uh, because of their social location has a lot of social problems. So, so we have all those things in reaching out. That's why it's called a local church, which is the needs of our community. Uh, but let's not assume that if you are in the middle class or upper middle class, there's no problem. There are also other problems in our neighborhood. You know, um, What about migrant workers and things like that? So we can just look at our own backyard. I think that would be a good place uh, for us uh, uh, to start. Okay. Young, I think you're, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, sorry. All right. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you, Ron, Dr. Lim Ga Young. All right, so there is. Uh, so I think that's it for the questions. Maybe I'll just give uh, another minute or so uh, to anyone who wants to type. Uh, questions. If there is none, I think we can uh, yeah, dismiss. Okay, just a gentle reminder to uh, fill up the feedback form uh, from the link attached and we will send you the slides in a day or two. I uh, also just want uh, to let you guys know that this session is recorded. We will also upload the video in a day or two, but give us a little bit of time to, uh, to submit it. Okay, I think that's it. All right. So, um, so right now, what I'll do is I'll just leave this slide on. Uh, 
we want to thank uh, Reverend Dr. Lim Kayong for uh, imparting his words of wisdom to us uh, and giving us more insight to the Gospel of Matthew and to the Kingdom of Parables. Uh, we, uh, yeah, so we will close in prayer. Uh, let's pray. Father, we, as we look forward to the Holy Week where we are reminded of your death uh, and your resurrection, Father, we ask that we uh, take a hard look at ourselves uh, be, and be reminded a lot of the calling that you've given to us. Uh, we are thankful that we are saved by grace. We are saved. Uh, uh, we are like the workers who came in late. Uh, we, don't, we don't deserve it. Uh, but Father, at the same time, we want to give you thanks for all things. And so we want to ask that in our response of love that we reach out to the community that you have asked us to reach out to the marginalized, the poor, to those who cannot help themselves. We want to pray, Lord, that you be with us uh, this session. Uh, we thank you for Reverend Dr. Lim Kayam who has uh, uh, shared with us your word and we ask that you continue to bless and uphold him in all that he does. So Father, we ask that you dismiss us with your peace and with your favor. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Dr. Thank Nikaya. you. All right, thank you everyone also for attending. Uh, we'll see you all next week in Sunday service. God bless you all. All right, thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, we, we, just, we just have a short debrief lah, in the breakout room. Yeah, okay. just see if anything that we can yeah, improve or 